Hello everyone and welcome back to Lewis Fiction and welcome to the finale of The Spectacular Spider-Man. This is the culmination of everything from seasons three all the way to this film. If you have not seen the series so far, make sure you go back and watch this before you watch this to get the full experience. And without the way, I present to you Spectacular Spider-Man and the Curse of the Spot. The date, August 2012. Peter Parker soars through the sky in his Spider-Man costume. It's a few days before his birthday. Everything is going well at the moment. Peter will narrate using his inner monologue as he always does, catching us up from the past year. He's been at college for a year already studying physics. He will tell us how he's also gotten really close with the professor. And with all of that going on, he still had the time to be Spider-Man and make a bit of extra money on the side by handing in photos to Frontline. Although nothing major has happened, Peter has gotten his life pretty balanced out. And for once, Peter Parker is doing okay. Things are looking up, but that's not the best part. As Peter lands on top of a building, he'll reach into a pouch in his suit, where he usually keeps spare web cartridges. In a glimmer, he pulls out a shiny silver banded ring with a cyan blue diamond on top. He will say the best part of his life recently is the girl who used to live next door, Mary Jane Watson. And tomorrow night, he's going to ask her to marry him. The past year or so, Peter and MJ have been living together as MJ further progresses her acting career through her acting college, which she is now in her third and final year of. They're both still young, but that doesn't bother Peter. He knows he's ready. He knows that he'll never spend his days with anyone other than her. She is the one for him, his soulmate, his lifelong dream. And in this moment, as Peter looks over the ring in the New York City skyline, he thinks to himself, how? Is he good enough? This is something that Peter Parker would somehow get wrong. This is something that the Parker look would have something to say about. With many self-doubts clouding his mind, the typical Peter Parker self-doubt talk will consume his every thought. Luckily, he has something to take his mind off it, as a store bell rings below and Peter swoops down to stop a crime. Dodging, weaving, and threading his way through the criminals, Peter also showcases at this moment in time how experienced he is as Spider-Man now. He's not a teenager anymore. He's a veteran Spider-Man. We've come a very long way. We cut to the next day. Peter is at college, just starting his second year. It's his first week, but everything is largely the same. It's business as usual. Peter will enter his class, and this is where we will be introduced to the professor Peter mentioned earlier. His name? Professor Jonathan On. On will introduce the class, but will smirk and nod to Peter as he walks in. Peter sits down towards the middle row, and the class goes on. On signifies his intelligence. He's calculated, passionate, and exciting. No wonder his class was a hit. The lesson will be on black holes and time travel. On will go into excruciating detail about the structural integrity of wormholes and space-time, saying that it's a part of science that is largely left to be theorized about rather than to be executed and tested. On is the best in the business when it comes to this sort of stuff, and it'll be showcased and completely on display here. After the lesson, Peter will catch up with Professor On. They will shake each other's hand and will be pleased to see each other after the summer break. We will get the impression that Peter is top of the class and the clear favorite. Professor On will tell Peter that he's unfortunately Unfortunately, not going to be able to make next week's class, and Peter asks why. And Professor On tells Peter quite nonchalantly that it's his wife's funeral next week. Caught off guard by this, Peter takes a step back, not expecting him to deliver such horrific news. Peter says he's so sorry for his loss, and On says it's okay. It happened over the summer, and he then brushes it off and says he doesn't want to talk about it. Professor On clearly is hiding away from it, running, and not confronting his loss. He's bottling his emotions up, and this will be clear. He doesn't want to confront his wife's death, and this will be on show here. On leaves Peter and tells him to have a good day. However, on his way out, Professor On drops some files on the floor. Blueprints. Peter helps him and picks them up for him. Peter notices, however, some kind of machine printed on the front. This was strange for Peter. On never kept secrets, especially science-related, and this was something that Peter has never seen before or never seen Professor On talk about. On grabbed the blueprints and left for the day. We then cut to Peter returning home. MJ is in the living room watching television, and Peter startles her. She shouts at him momentarily before smirking and being joyed at his arrival. She runs to him and jumps swiveling in his arms before kissing him. They look like the happiest couple in the world. MJ asks how college was, and Peter says it was good, before asking how her day was. MJ will tell him that things went smoothly, their next play is coming along, but they don't think it'll be a while before it gets done. Peter then asks MJ if she's excited for their date tonight. MJ asks, what date? Aren't they going out for his birthday soon? And Peter says yes, but he's planned this for a while. He's saved up enough money to take them both out. On him. Just the both of them. MJ's face lights up as she kisses him once more. We cut to them both getting ready to go out. Peter is flicking through his phone, reading up on articles about Professor On's wife. 
He will ask MJ if she knew about it, and she'll say no. Peter will read a headline from the New York Times that will say Mrs. On was shot in a back alley in Queens on July 14th, 2012. That's mental, Peter will think to himself. He never would have known. However, Peter ends up pushing this aside as they go out for their date. Peter hides the ring in his back pocket, growing more nervous by the minute. When they sit down at their table, MJ can clearly see how nervous he actually was and asks him what's wrong. Peter simply replies, nothing, but MJ could tell. Every second felt like a minute and every minute felt like an hour. The time was coming, but Peter had no idea what to do with himself. He needed something to break the inner silence. And in the nick of time, an excuse arose for Peter to run from his fear, screaming from outside. Annoyingly, this ruined their big night, but Peter low-key felt relieved. More time to ponder, he'll think to himself. Peter rushes outside as MJ gives him the go-ahead, and he spots something rather strange. A few blocks down, a man fully white head to toe, covered in black spots. Peter changes outfits quickly and rushes over to investigate. The man who Peter nicknames The Spot sounds terrified. He profusely apologizes to the people who run from him on the street. Spider-Man asks, who is he? And the man says he doesn't know what's going on. Spider-Man says they can get him help as Peter outstretches his arm and offers his hand out to him. As The Spot offers his hand back, something shoots from his fingertips. Peter's spider sense reacts in time for him to dodge out the way. The man cries saying he doesn't know what's going on and Spider-Man says to stay calm because whatever is happening is getting worse. The man says he can't, as an outburst of emotion causes more things to shoot from him. Most of them evaporate until one lands on the street in front of them. As Peter looks around, the absolute worst scenario that could occur became reality. Peter fully realized what was going on. People, lampposts, and cars were all started to be sucked towards it. It's a singularity, Peter would think to himself. As Peter could start to feel his feet slip, he shouts to the man, just shut it down, do something! The black hole rips through the ground and starts to make a crater in the earth. Sirens start blurting as Peter looks up to the sky. The world is about to end. As they knew it, Peter looks over to the restaurant with MJ stood looking outside towards the scene. As their world collapsed around them, all they could think about was each other. The end is near. The spot panickingly opened another singularity and jumped through it. Screw it, Peter thought to himself. What is there left to lose? And in a moment of life or death, Peter follows the spot through the same portal, and silence. New York ambience filled the air. One eye opened, followed by the next. On top of the Chrysler building awoke Peter Parker. He jolts up panting, sweating, heart racing. He looks around at his hands. He's alive. He knows that much. What is going on? He looks down towards the city. Everything is okay. Did he just dream that? He'll reach into his back pocket to see the ring is still there still intact. He'll take a breath. What just happened? Where is he? What is going on? Peter's mind ponders to the different possibilities. However, in the distance, all of a sudden, a little girl screamed as falling rubble and debris started crashing down her way. Peter's spider sense ignited ferociously as he swooped down, and with about 10 seconds to spare, Spider-Man swung in to save the day, placing the little girl down. He asks if she's okay. The girl says yes, as tears start to well in her eyes. Police cars suddenly rush past, as Peter finds himself in the middle of another crisis. Maybe it's the spot, he'll think to himself. And that's when a bright red figure whooshes past in one direction. Peter squints. It can't be. Is he seeing things? And with that, another figure whooshes past as well. Oh my god. It's venom and carnage. What the heck, Peter will think to himself. What are they doing back in New York? Especially Cletus. And that's when he saw a third figure on the scene. A bright red and blue costume caught the side of his eye. Who is this? Another symbiote? You can't be serious, Peter will ponder. But that's when he realized. Wait a minute. He's been here before. That's not another symbiote. That's him. Peter sees a newspaper thrown away on the side of the street. He picks it up. It's the Daily Bugle. Expecting all of this to somehow be explained, he awaited to see the year 2012 to be printed out on the front. But when he actually read it, it read 2009. Peter's eyes will widen with shock. He webs up to a building above and takes his mask off. 2009? This can't be right, surely. Peter panics. He goes down to the streets, asking people what year it was, and for sure, every single one of them said 2009. And that's when it clicks. The black hole that he went through. It sent him back in time. Not only was it a black hole, it was a wormhole. Peter will say this is heavy, as he sits down to take it all in. The spot can open wormholes, a rip in space and time that allows past travel. How and why? That doesn't matter at the moment. Peter says he's going to have to figure that out later. But all Peter needs to focus on doing now is getting back to the future. We then cut to another place, another time. 
It's white. In fact, it's blindingly white. Nothing but emptiness. In the crevice appears the man with black holes. The spot. He panics. How did he get here? What is going on? Loads of thoughts will run through his mind. He'll say to himself, he's a scientist. All he has to do is just think about this logically. Around him, as he floats through this white dimension, spots start appearing around him. But not any regular spots. There will be events playing in them. His birth, his birthdays, his first kiss, his first major job interview. And that's when he realizes he's not in any old place. He has entered the fourth dimension. A place where time doesn't exist. A place outside of time. A place where any point in time can be accessed. And that's when he sees one particular event. He watches on, as in a dark alleyway, in a warm night in Queens, he walks with his wife. Knowing what happens next, all he can do is turn and look away as he hears the gunshot in the background. As it's revealed, the spot is in fact Professor Jonathan On, and he's just watched his wife's death all over again. Afraid and scared, he looked in the opposite direction, afraid to see his loss. And that's when all the spots, all of the events in his life transform into the same thing, all replaying the same event over and over and over again. The dreaded gunshot played again, 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 and again. He's stuck and he can't get out and all he can do is suffer. Meanwhile, we cut back to future Peter, stuck in 2009. He thinks to himself that he's gonna have to stay off the radar. Time travel is dangerous, and if time travel movies have taught him anything, it's to never interact with yourself. Peter hatches a plan. He has to get out of here before he disrupts anything, and there is only one man who can help him. Two years before they were meant to initially meet, Peter approaches the classroom at ESU campus of Professor Jonathan On. If there's one man who knows anything about black holes, wormholes, or time travel, it is this man. Peter thinks this is the only man who can help him. However, when Peter enters, the lights flicker on and no one is there. Peter looks around and looks towards where he'd usually sit in the middle of the classroom. He walks down the lecture hall stairs and makes his way to On's desk. He notices blueprints, and that's when it clicked. Those are the same blueprints from before. The one with the machine on the front. Before Peter could discover anything more, the professor enters the room. He asks Peter, who the hell are you? And Peter responds quickly, saying that he needs his help. On will say that he doesn't know who he is, and if he wants to see him, either sign up to his class or make an appointment as On sternly rushes Peter out of the door. Peter will say that they know each other, just not yet, from another time, as he is quickly trying to explain the situation. And that's when On stops in his tracks, and his eyes widen. Peter says he knows On from the future, and he desperately needs his help. We cut to On sitting on his desk with one head in his hand, contemplating everything Peter was telling him, as Peter explains the entire situation leading up to this moment. Professor On asks for proof, as Peter shows him a receipt for the ring that he bought for MG in his pocket, with 2012 printed as the date. He explains that he came from the future and he needs his help to get back there, using some kind of wormhole. On will say, does this mean that my machine worked? Peter says he didn't come through his machine. Some guy sent him here. A guy with holes. On's eyes light up, as he pulls out a sketch from his drawer. He will ask Peter if he looked anything like this, as he shows Peter a picture of a man with black holes printed over his skin. Peter says, yeah, kind of like that. Professor On will tell Peter that from his calculations and predictions, this is what could happen if his device failed, which could only mean one thing. Peter says he'll need to go back just before whatever happened, so he can stop or warn someone or something. He needs to get back before the entire world gets decimated. Professor On will go on to ask Peter who used it, who used his machine and turned themselves into that freak, and Peter says he doesn't know. On will say, well, whoever it was must have been pretty desperate to take that risk. And then something clicks in Peter's head. He thought about what On told him in the future. And that's when Peter will say he might think he has an idea. Professor On will ask who, and Peter will say, you did. On will say that's absurd. He would never take such a risk. And he wants further details from Peter. Peter is hesitant to say it first, saying to On that whatever he tells him can affect time. And he can't screw anything else up. On says that he won't help him if he doesn't tell him. And that's when Peter concedes, saying that his wife dies. And putting together the pieces, Peter realized that it was probably Professor On of the future trying to use the device to go back in time and stop his wife's death before it happened. And then he turned into the spot. On will sit down and place his hand on his heart. He tells Peter that he must be lying. Peter says he's not. That's the goddamn truth. On agrees to help Peter, but he can't promise anything will work. His machine isn't ready yet. And Peter will say to let him help. And as they get to work, 
We enter a montage of the Professor On of the past becoming friends and taking a liking to Peter of the future. Sort of showing us how Peter and On became friends in the future. Really trying to home in on and flesh out that relationship. After countless hours of work overnight, Professor On will say it's done. Peter does one final check through the calculations to make sure everything is on point and notices one thing is off. The proportion of energy is ever so slightly too high for what the machine can handle. He remedies the calculation and everything is set to go. And Peter steps into the machine. Before he leaves, On asks Peter one final question. Where does his wife die? Peter says he can't tell him that. On holds his head down. Peter concedes due to the friendship that he's built with On over the last 12 hours. Professor On is helping Peter get back to the future. This is the least he could do, he would think to himself. He'll say summer 2012. Avoid dark alleys. On will nod to Peter and thank him. Peter will thank On as he flicks the switch and Peter nervously awaits as the machine turns on, praying it doesn't turn him into the spot, or worse. Peter is sent through a white-like dimension, and everything twists and turns around him, time dilating in front of his eyes. And then he lands back in New York. He looks around for a newspaper or something. He picks up the nearest one to him. It's an article by Frontline, with the date 2012 written on top. Peter breathes a sigh of relief. He's home, and by the looks of things, no sign of the spot. It worked. The device worked. Maybe whatever calculation Peter fixed may have just saved the entire world from being crushed into a singularity. And with that, Peter swings home. He walks up to his apartment stairs and reaches the top. He reaches into his back pocket, the ring nervously awaiting him. He opens the door and surprise, happy birthday banners stricken across his apartment. But as he looked down, his eyes widened and his heart pounded. His teeth quivered with mass amounts of dread. Gwen, Captain Stacy, MJ? All stood in front of him, and out the background, a woman stepped from the kitchen, holding a cake. Peter couldn't believe his eyes. It was Aunt May. They all gathered round Peter singing happy birthday, but the world went quiet as their voices drowned out. How did this happen? Is this Mysterio's doing? This has got to be some kind of illusion, surely, Peter would think to himself. And then that's when he realised, the little girl that he saved earlier out of instinct, that was the girl that Captain Stacy saved. That was the moment George Stacy lost his life all those years ago, and Peter prevented it. He stopped it, and here in front of him lies the remnants of the new timeline that he has now created. MJ walks over to him and kisses him on the cheek, wrapping her arms around him, telling him they're sorry they couldn't pull this surprise birthday party on his actual birthday, which was in a few days. Gwen, unfortunately, wouldn't have been able to make it, and George was on duty, so today was the only day. Peter, still trying to fathom what is going on, sheepishly says that's okay, still trying to process everything that's happening, his eyes flickering between George and May. For Peter, it was like seeing ghosts. These were people that he lost, people that died, but they're here, alive and well. Aunt May says she forgot some apple sauce for the dinner that they're having tonight and makes her way towards the door. However, Peter intervenes, saying he can go and get some, trying to get out and get some fresh air. Aunt May will tell him that's alright, dear. She doesn't mind. It's his birthday, after all. Aunt May leaves through the front door as Peter watches on in disbelief. He turns back to face George and Gwen. Gwen tells Peter that he looks really stiff, asking if everything is okay. Peter says everything's fine. He just had some trouble on his swing over here. And then George flicks a stern eye towards him. Peter, confused, stops in his tracks. Gwen knew he was Spider-Man before, but does she now? There are so many things in this new timeline that Peter doesn't know. He has to tread carefully, and that's when George pulls him aside for one moment as they step outside. George tells Peter that he thought they had an agreement not to tell Gwen, to leave her out of this. Peter will say, yeah, he's sorry, it's just been a long day, he wasn't thinking straight. George will say it's fine, he just wants to keep her safe, that's all. And that confirms it. Because Captain Stacy is alive, it meant that Gwen never moved away, which meant that Peter somehow never ended up revealing to Gwen that he's Spider-Man. George heads back inside while Peter stays out for one moment, trying to process everything that's going on. But then he thinks, maybe this isn't so bad. They always say in time travel movies, never mess with time, but everything is perfect. All the people that he's lost in his life are back and alive. Maybe things have actually turned out okay for Peter Parker after all. Peter heads back inside happy, embracing this new life that he accidentally created for himself. He sits down at the table as he digs into cake. This is the life Peter always wanted, and now it's a reality. After everything's settled, George has to go. He's up early the next morning, and he offers to drop Aunt May off in Queens as well. Aunt May thanks him for the offer as they leave Peter and MJ's apartment. A few moments later, Gwen says she's gonna get going as well. Peter says he'll walk her back to hers, and tells MJ he'll be back in a few minutes. On their way back to Gwen's, They'll both catch up with one another. 
the first time that Peter has spoken to Gwen in years. Gwen will tell Peter that she's thinking about going to college to study biology, and they generally talk about normal school-related stuff. But all the while, Peter is just so bewildered. He's talking to Gwen Stacy. Gwen Stacy, the one that moved away. He hasn't spoken to Gwen in years, and this is crazy, he'll think to himself. In this scene, we also learn a lot about Gwen, since we haven't seen her since Season 4. This is the moment where we get to know what she potentially would have been up to if the events of Season 4 didn't transpire. They reach Gwen's apartment, and they say goodnight to each other. However, just before Gwen could enter her block, Peter collapses to the floor. Gwen turns around swiftly to see Peter on his hands and knees. She asks if he's okay, and Peter says, Yeah, he's okay, he didn't know what came over him. Maybe he's just lightheaded, he says. Gwen nods and leaves, entering her apartment block. Peter thinks that was weird. What was that about? And then halfway down the street, it happens again. A glitching sensation, his body almost rejecting itself. It's like reality around him is being warped. He eventually makes his way home when he cuddles on the sofa with MJ. They're watching a film, but Peter is frozen still. MJ asks what's wrong. He's been acting weird all day. Peter says he's fine as he gets up and goes to the bathroom. He ponders over what just happened. He looks in the mirror and sure enough, he starts glitching again. This time it's more painful and lasts for longer. After everything he's been through in the last 48 hours, surely something else can't go wrong. But after pondering to himself, he comes to a conclusion. The only valid explanation as to what is going on is this reality is rejecting him. It sounds like a really corny sci-fi movie, but that's the only explanation he has. He changed time, and now time is fighting back. He messed with something that should have ultimately been out of his hands. This moment in the film becomes the embodiment of Spider-Man and what it means to have the great responsibility. Peter doesn't know the consequences, but is he willing to find out? After all the loss and all the grief that he has been put through over the years, he somehow ended up in a timeline where everything was perfect. However, as we know, Spider-Man's life is never perfect. All the right people were around him and life was good, but at what cost? And now, with what looks like time and reality fighting back, Peter has to make the noble sacrifice to lose those he loves once more. This moment, this decision, will be the hardest Peter has ever had to make. But this is the culmination of responsibility for the spectacular Spider-Man. All he has to do now is prove he has the grit, prove he has the fight to do what's right. Peter looks at himself in the mirror and sheds a tear. He knows what he must do, he knows he has to fix this, he knows what's going on, because he knows this timeline isn't ultimately right. He can't lose Aunt May again though, he can't lose Gwen or Captain Stacy again. But whatever he is, whatever he's created isn't natural, and the outcome could be much worse if he doesn't do anything about it. What happens once Peter's gone? Will they go for Aunt May next? Will they go for MJ next? Will they go for Gwen next? Who knows? What if the entire universe comes collapsing down because of Peter? He knows what he has to do. Thunder claps New York's skyline as it pours with rain. Peter makes his way to an address on the outskirts of the Bronx. There is only one man that can help him. The man that he's turned to several times before. He knocks on the door and a woman opens up saying, can I help you? Peter says he's looking for Professor On. The woman takes a step back and looks around. She says she doesn't know what kind of sick game he's playing and for him to leave her alone as she tries to close the door. But Peter holds her open saying it's urgent. The woman says you don't understand, do you? Jonathan On is dead. Peter, confused, asks how. The woman quivers. She says that she should know because she's his wife. And that's when it hits Peter, as we flash back to when Peter told On about how his wife would die. The event that was meant to kill Jonathan's wife killed him instead. Peter tells Mrs. On that he was a friend of Jonathan's. We then cut to a scene of Mrs. On and Peter talking in the kitchen. She makes Peter a hot cup of coffee. She asks him how he knew John. Peter says he's an old friend from ESU. She asks if he's a student, and he says, kind of, but he knew Professor On a little bit better than just a student. After a few moments of reflection, she asks Peter why he needed to see him, what was so important. Peter tells her what she's about to hear won't make much sense, but his research that he was doing on wormholes and time travel, it worked. And as Peter finished that sentence, he glitched out again, smashing the coffee all over the floor. This startles Mrs. On, as she asks if Peter is okay. Peter gets back up and says he's fine, but he needs to see On's research, because whatever is going on with him is going to get a lot worse if he doesn't do something. As Mrs. On leads him into the professor's workspace at her house, Peter asks if she knows where the machine is, and Mrs. On says, what machine? And Peter says, the machine that makes you time travel, the wormhole machine. And then she'll remember as it clicks in her mind. That machine? Professor On destroyed it three years ago. Peter places his head in his hands. Mrs. On goes on to tell Peter that he destroyed it because he saw how dangerous it could become and was scared of the outcome and the consequences of it. Peter asks if she knows where any of this research is. 
She takes him to a cabinet with muddled files. She says these are what's left of his research, and that Peter can have them. Peter picks them up. It's the same blueprint that he saw earlier. He thanks Mrs. On, and she says it's okay. Peter leaves as he heads to ESU. We then cut back to present day spot in the white dimension. Time isn't relevant for him, but we get the impression that he's been stuck there for eternity, watching the death of his wife over and over again. Insane and numb, the spot's anger fueled him to the brim. And that's when it happened. The visions of his wife's death started to change and mold into something different, something a little bit more sinister. Instead of his wife dying, he could see himself dying, getting shot instead. This confused him at first. However, he started to glitch, similar to Peter who resided inside the timeline. He pondered for a second before seeing flashes of Peter. The events of the timeline changed in front of his very eyes. Peter changing events in front of him, leading to his own death. During this time, On would find out that Peter is Spider-Man 2. All his pent-up rage and anger had to be directed somewhere. As he glitched and reality started to wipe his presence from the universe, he found the cause. Peter Parker is the problem. We will then cut back to Peter as we get a montage of him progressively getting worse. The glitching is really slowing him down, but in the process he builds the machine by himself using ESU resources, showing his intelligence and intellect. This will really show how smart Peter actually is, and how far he's come as a character. After moments of determination and hard work, the machine is done. He then goes on to map out his plan. He'll narrate to us over as he talks us through his plan. He has to return to 2009, stopping himself from saving the girl, and to let Captain Stacy do it to return time to the way it naturally took its course. Then go to Professor Arn's office, and leave a note correcting the misfired calculation, and then return back to 2012, and hopefully, everything is in check and back to normal and hopefully he will have fixed reality and this whole mess but before he goes there are a few stops that he has to make first we cut to peter outside of gwen's apartment he rings the doorbell and she answers she asks what is peter doing here it's late and peter says that he needs to talk to her she invites him inside and peter will go on to say that there is something that he's wanted to tell her for a long time that he should have told her a long time ago gwen is confused when she squints her eyes her heart beating not knowing what to say Peter will say that he's wanted to tell her before she found out from someone else, or something else. He will say that she deserves to know, and then he'll say it. I am Spider-Man. Gwen doesn't believe him at first, and she even laughs, but Peter webs something from the table with his web shooters, startling Gwen, catching her off guard. Peter realizes that if he is to leave this timeline and course correct everything back to the way it was meant to be, this timeline will cease to exist and the old one will return, which means that this version of Gwen won't remember any of this. If we remember back to seasons three and four, he was never able to tell Gwen he was Spider-Man how he wanted to, and that was a great regret that has haunted him ever since. Well, now Peter can finally return to that moment in season four and have peace of mind that he did the right thing. Gwen will ask Peter why he's telling her this now, and Peter will say it doesn't matter why, just that he thought that she should know, and that it was the right thing to do. Confused and baffled, Gwen watched as Peter swung away into the night. As Peter scaled the New York skyline, he felt into his back pocket, the ring still there. And then in an instant, another glitch, this time more powerful and more painful than before. He doesn't have much time left, Peter will think to himself. He gets back up, one more stop to go. We cut to Queens, Forest Hills, Spider-Man swings over to his old home, the home that he grew up in. He changes into his civilian clothing and makes his way to the front door. He knocks, eagerly anticipating an answer. And of course, the door opens. A bright smile comes across Peter's face. Aunt May stands in front of him. She'll tell him that he's silly for knocking. Why didn't he just come in? And Peter says he's giving her space. He doesn't live here anymore. May brushes her off as she asks him if he wants a drink. Peter will say he's okay. May sits down with him on the sofa and asks what brings him by. She knows he's very busy nowadays with college. But before Peter could speak, May excitedly asks about Mary Jane as well, asking how her acting career is coming along. Peter says it's great, but that's what he came here to talk about. Peter pulls out the ring from his back pocket. May says, that isn't what I think it is, is it? Peter says it is. He's going to ask Mary Jane to marry him. Aunt May in pure excitement brings Peter in for a big hug. Peter smiles and embraces the hug as tightly as humanly possible. She pulls away and says, that's great news. Peter tells her there's just one issue. Every time he wants to ask the question, he quivers and gets all nervous. He doesn't know what to do, and he wants to make it as special as humanly possible for her. Aunt May says, that's totally normal to be nervous for this sort of thing. Uncle Ben was. She will stand up and walk over to a picture frame on the wall. She'll take it down and bring it over. 
It's a picture of her and Uncle Ben, just moments after he proposed to her. Peter chuckles, commenting on how young they are. May will say that if Ben were here, he'd tell you exactly the same thing. Just do it. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Because the very act of you getting down on one knee and asking that girl to marry you is special no matter what. She'll go on to tell Peter that, in all fairness, when she was younger, she had this grand idea that everything had to be perfect. There had to be candles, roses, and confetti, and everything. But when Ben did it, nothing else around mattered. Everything else disappeared because the only thing that was in focus was Ben Parker sat there on one knee holding a beautiful ring. May will outstretch her finger to see the very same ring from that day. She'll place a hand on Peter's shoulder and tell him not to worry about where he does it or how. May will ask if they're happy and if they both feel as if it's time. And Peter will say, of course. And Aunt May will say, then there's nothing in your way. There is nothing stopping you, only in your head. Peter hugs Aunt May and thanks her. A slight conjure of tears forms in Peter's eyes. Peter needed that. He needed to hear those words. One final lesson before he lost her for good. And as Peter leaves, he watches Aunt May go back to her nightly routine. He can't watch, but he knows for the greater good, the fate of reality could be in his hands. He says goodbye one final time as a tear rolls down his cheek. Without another moment to spare, he makes his way back to the machine, turns it on and makes his way back to the year 2009. He arrives in New York. It's game time for Peter, he'll think to himself. He has to act quickly. He sees himself about to swing down to save the little girl, and in a moment of no hesitation, he webs himself, pulling himself back. Past Peter is confused, asking what the hell is he doing, as he instantly fades from existence. Peter watches on as he takes his mask off, as Captain Stacy saves the girl, and the rubble lands directly in his path. Peter cries, reliving the same pain for the fate of the universe, for the fate of time, for the fate of reality. The most noble sacrifice to lose those who he loved, and that is the great responsibility that he lives for. After regaining himself as the battle in the distance between Venom, Carnage, and himself rages on, he travels to Professor On's office and drops off a note with the right calculation on. Quickly, before Peter could interfere with anything else, he returned back to the future, having, of course, corrected his mistakes. Peter checks a newspaper. Frontline, the year 2012. He's back. He looks around. Everything seems to be fine. No sign of the spot. No sign of the world collapsing in front of him. He checks his hands. The glitching has stopped. He's done it. He's won. Finally. But before Peter could relax fully, a hole starts to form in front of him, and a hand dramatically crunches itself onto the New York street. Peter watches as none other than the spot makes his way out from the fourth dimension, escaping back into the real world. He looks to Peter's way, gritting his name between his teeth. Peter, in a fighting position, questions how he still exists. The spot tells Peter he's been trapped in that hell for thousands of years, and now Peter is going to suffer for everything he's caused to him. Peter, confused more than anything else, tries to break through to On, saying he's sorry about his wife, he's sorry about everything that happened. Peter tells him he's going to destroy everything if he isn't careful, and then Professor On says he doesn't care anymore, when he glitches and collapses to his knees, and that's when Peter realises. This isn't current day Professor On. This is the Professor On that he followed into the wormhole originally. He was trapped outside of time. Peter kneels down to On, who lay on the floor powerless and weak, the glitching getting worse for him, the timeline course-correcting back to its natural state. On fades from existence in front of Peter, never to be seen again. Peter, relieved, takes a breath as he says he's sorry. He couldn't save him, but Spider-Man can't save everyone. And as the final conflict comes to a close, we cut to a few days later. Peter is making breakfast as MJ greets him good morning. They kiss, and Peter says that they should go for a walk, just them both. MJ says that sounds like a good idea. After breakfast, they head out. They walk through Central Park as Peter hangs tightly to the ring in his pocket. He tells MJ to turn around and to cover her eyes. MJ thinks this is slightly odd at first, but then Peter takes a deep breath, thinking back to what Aunt May said to him. He gets down on one knee and tells MJ to turn around and open her eyes. And as she does, a wave of adrenaline comes over her as she places her hands on her mouth as a glistening, cyan blue ring stared her back in the face. Peter utters the words, Will you marry me? And with no hesitation, MJ reaches out to Peter with both arms and embraces him, saying, Yes, of course you'll marry him. And as we fade out, our two lovers, Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson, have their happy ending. Despite the trauma and tribulations they've faced, everything always turns out okay in the end, as our journey comes to a close. 
The spectacular Spider-Man story comes to an end, but a new journey awaits. We open back up one final time to Spider-Man sitting on a building holding his lunch when an orange portal opens in front of him. He's startled and spits it out as out walks a tall, bulky man in a blue and red costume. Peter, he will say. Peter will say, who the hell are you? The man will introduce himself as Miguel. He will tell Peter that this incident with time travel almost destroyed the multiverse, or at the very least, his universe entirely. Peter, confused, says, there's a multiverse? Miguel will say, yes. What he did by saving the girl disrupted what we know as a canon event. Something that, if disrupted, can cause massive consequences, such as universes annihilating themselves. Peter asks if that's why he was glitching out, and Miguel will say yes. That was the very start of it. Peter will ask how come the universe didn't collapse when the spot glitched out, and got wiped from reality right in front of his eyes. Miguel explains that's because the spot's death was something natural to the progressive, unorthodox nature of the universe, not a set event that cannot be undone. But Captain Stacy's death was an example of something that could not be undone. Peter will think this is mental, but Miguel will go on to commend Peter, saying that the way he managed to fix everything by himself single-handedly was impressive, and that's why he wants to give him this. Miguel throws the multiverse watch at him. As he catches it, an orange glow appears on the front of it. Peter asks, what the hell is this? And Miguel says it's an invite. It's an invite to the Spider-Verse, in which we cut for one final time right there. Thank you very much for watching Spectacular Spider-Man and the Curse of the Spot. This was the finale of the entire series as a whole. Everything from season three up until now. It's been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. It's been an absolute roller coaster. Hopefully you enjoyed this final part. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. And we're now going to leave it there and move on to new series and new chapters for the channel. I want to give you a little teaser. The next big series on the channel will be MTV Spider-Man Season 2. You guys get to be excited for that. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Once again, thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you guys on Thursday for a brand new video. Take care and peace.